morning, United Church. I'm really glad you're here this morning. I don't know about you, but I woke up this morning and it was one of those mornings because of what's happening outside that you really just don't feel like rolling out of your bed. Anybody with me? You really didn't want to get out of bed this morning. You just wanted to stay in your comfortable bed and sleep in a little bit. Well, I'm really glad you're here. I remember being in college and whenever you would wake up on a morning like that, you wouldn't roll out of bed, uh, right? <laughs> you would just stay in bed and skip class. And, uh, you know, some people continue to have that mentality. Maybe you're a boss and, you know, rainy days are like, oh, no, people aren't going to show up to work today. Uh, and, and, you know, as a pastor, it's like, oh, you're going to have less people be here on Sunday. You know, it's a sleeping in. I'm really glad you're here because it's a special morning uh, that we're celebrating today as we talk about Compassion Sunday that Rachel talked about and I'll talk about a little bit later on. But we are in a series where we're studying this book called Thessalonians. And if you've never heard about that, I'll explain it to you in a second. But first, I want to make sure you have this book in your hands. And so it's in the Bible. And if you don't have a Bible, we have a couple guys that are around the room right now. If you don't have a Bible, raise your hand because I want to make sure uh, you you have the opportunity to open up and read uh, what's in this book because you'll be un, it'll be sound unbelievable. So you want to see these words for yourself. Raise your hand. Just wave, wave these guys down if they don't have a Bible, and we'll be glad to get one in your hand. Now, one of the words that we're going to see in the passage that we're studying today uh, is an interesting word. It's uh, destiny or destined. Raise your hand if you, if you think about this word a bunch, like my destiny. What's my destiny? Or what, what have I been destined for? You know, I started following Jesus in the late 90s, and this was a really popular thing at that time in Christian circles. It was like, what's your destiny? It's like your fulfillment or what's, you know, what are you called to? What is the greatness that God has for you or so, something? There was even a Christian group called People of Destiny international. And, uh, and so it's just like this popular word. There's even posters that, you know, you would see on people's walls. Like, for instance, I have one of these posters. It's a, I don't have it personally. I saw this poster. It says that the choices we make, not the chances we take, determine our destiny. And so the picture on the poster leads you to believe that if you make good choices, you'll just be able to hang out on a island and for the rest of your life, right? Like, I don't know what the, some like pictures are mountains, you know, beautiful mountains of destiny, you know, it's like make good choices and you'll have a great life at the beach or living in the mountains. I don't know. But when we think of this word destiny, I want you to think about this. As a follower of Jesus, if you're here this morning and you're a follower of Jesus, what are you destined for? And, and maybe you're not a follower of Jesus yet, and you think about uh, what do people who follow Jesus think they're destined for? You know, you might fill in the blank, like eternal life, or Jesus said, you know, to, in your fulfilling life, you know, because Jesus says, all who follow me, you know, I will, like, I will give them rest. So there's restfulness or there's fullness of joy in his presence, you know. So you might fill in the blank with some of these things that we're destined for. But the word that we're going to see this morning might surprise you as we study the next passage in this book called First Thessalonians. So if you have that Bible, go ahead and open it up to this book of the Bible called First Thessalonians. It's on page 574 in the Bibles that we passed passed out, um, and we're going to start in the second chapter. And the reason this book is called Thessalonians is because there is a town called Thessalonica. And uh, in this town, uh, there were some people who started to follow Jesus. The Apostle Paul visited this town. He was there for like three weeks or so. And he helped people start following Jesus and teaching them some pretty basic beginner stuff. You think of three weeks, what am I going to learn about following Jesus? You're going to lay the foundation, the most important, crucial truths about um, what it means to follow Jesus. And so he starts to talk about some of those things again in this passage that we're looking at. So look at chapter 2, verse 17. I'm just going to start reading through this, and I'll interject some thoughts along the way. So look at it in 17. It says, But since we were torn away from you, brothers, for a short time, in person, not in heart, we endeavored more eagerly with great desire to see you face to face. Like this is this first verse. You're being introduced. Paul is very dramatic in his language here. Like I was torn away from you. You know, like if you have to go away for a work trip, I'm sure you're thinking to your spouse, I am sorry that my work is tearing me away from you, right? I'm sure every spouse has said that to the spouse that they had to leave. Or maybe, you know, you're younger and you have a curfew still and you're like, 
like saying to your parent, saying to your friends, my parents are tearing me away from you. I'm sure you've used this type of language, right? No, you haven't. Um, but this is kind of like the language Paul is using, and it's pretty legit because he was torn away. There was an angry mob. We've talked about this the last three weeks. There was an angry mob that didn't like Paul talking about Jesus, and they ran him out of the town of Thessalonica. And so that's why he's talking this dramatically. Like, I was literally torn away from you. People ran me out of the city. And he goes on to say uh, in verse 18, but we wanted to come back to you. And Paul is saying again and again, but Satan hindered us. Side note, don't recommend using that as an excuse that you couldn't get to work, um, that Satan hindered you. Um, but he says some, for some reason he has some spiritual insight, he's an apostle, that there was a demonic force that kept him from going back to the Thessalonians, the Thessalonica church. And so what, you're, what we're seeing so far is just this picture of this desire that Paul has to be with these people that he introduced to Jesus Christ. In three weeks' time, he had such a close relationship that he wanted to get back, but he couldn't back, get back. We don't know exactly what the circumstances were that he calls Satan hindering him to get back there. Either way, um, he couldn't get back there. And it goes on verse 1. Therefore, when we could bear it no longer, you know, like he can bear it no longer, that he can't get back there, what does he do? We were willing to be left behind at Athens alone, and we sent Timothy our brother and God's co-worker in the gospel of Christ to establish and exhort you in your faith. Here's one of the first things I want us to see just in kind of this language of Paul talking about how he longs to be with these followers of Jesus Christ. It's like, hey, what, what can we learn here? This just looks like Paul just exchange, exchanging pleasantries with the Thessalonians. And what can we really learn as we read these words? Well, one of the things that I want us to check out is this language that he used in terms of how he views himself and Timothy. He says, we're God's co-worker in the gospel of Christ. Like, he says God's co-worker. You know, sometimes we think about human interaction, we're equal, but co-worker thinks, you think like, I'm equal with somebody if you're their co-worker, right? Well, are we equal with God? Uh, well, not exactly. And the word here, more technically, um, the ancient word is a bit more different than like, hey, a coworker who is an equal, but it's in reference to somebody who would wait tables on you. Um, like, hey, can I take your order? Somebody who is there to serve the people at that table. So if, you're, uh, if you have ever worked in the restaurant business, you know that you're serving the people who are sitting at that table. How, how can I take your order? I'm a servant of these people. Well, that's how Paul views himself in reference to God, but also in reference to people. And something that's really important for us to understand this morning, just that we can learn as we go through a book of the Bible, verse by verse, um, is what does it mean to like, think about pastoral ministry or people who have the title reverend before their name? Reverend, you know, Brian Schultz always likes to joke with me, calling me bishop or reverend. And, uh, and, he, and he jokes with me that way because he knows that we're equal. He knows that I'm not better than him. And uh, yet sometimes we think that reverends or pastors or bishops are people that are to be esteemed highly and honored and revered. But what I love about the Apostle Paul, he's the one that should be honored and revered. He is like the hero of church planting ministry. He is the Apostle Paul who has written most of the books of the New Testament. And yet he's just saying like, I'm just a servant of the Lord. And not only am I just the servant of the Lord, I'm just your servant. I'm just here to serve you. So don't put, you know, a reserved parking space in the parking lot for me. You know, don't throw a special party for me on my birthday. I'm just here to serve you. And he's not looking and he's deflecting, you know, any honor or praise. And that's what I love about this understanding of pastoral ministry and ministry of those who serve the gospel of Jesus Christ on a regular basis. I think Paul would be pretty shocked and appalled um, if he came uh, to American culture, especially to see the pastor pampering and worship that happens in our world today. And because Jesus wasn't treated that way. Jesus wasn't pampered by anybody and neither were his first followers, the apostles. They laid their lives down. They were killed for the sake of the gospel. John the Baptist, also one of the most successful ministers uh, pointing people to Jesus, he, his phrase was, I mu uh, he must increase, I must decrease. Meaning like, look, Put me down a couple notches so 
I can make sure that Jesus is put up a couple notches. And so as we go through this letter, that, you know, this morning when I read this passage, I was like, I don't even know what to talk about this morning. It just seems like this exchange of um, some pleasantries between Paul and the Thessalonians. He wants to see them. But really, there's like this profound truth and insight into how we should view one another before we serve God together. Um, we should be less concerned about how people view us and more concerned about how people view Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not looking for you to like treat me poorly as a pastor or any other minister of the gospel that way. Uh, I think we should all treat each other equally. We should love one another. We should honor and respect each other. We should outdo each other in doing good deeds. Um, but we should also make sure we care the most for the reputation of Jesus Christ more than any other man or woman in this world. And so the question that like, like we're kind of asked this morning as we just follow these three first few verses is whose reputation do you live for more, Jesus or your own? Whose reputation do you live for in life more? College students have the opportunity to give presentations and, um, you know, often in group projects in their, in their classes. And I know several students that follow Jesus that like to maximize those times, not making sure they get a good grade, but to say like, hey, I can talk about Jesus in front of my class here. And it's perfectly acceptable. And they'll look to work in how they can talk about the great love of Jesus. In a presentation, they are people who are looking to further the reputation of Jesus more than their own. There are wealthy business owners that could have bigger houses and nicer things or more things. And yet they give money and resources away to the work of ministry, to churches, and to nonprofit organizations. Why? Because they think about the reputation of Jesus more than their own personal reputation. They're brilliant men and women who are looked up to, respected in their industries that show up to churches and set up signs. Um, they show up to churches and do tasks that you would think would be beneath them of, because of their intellect. It's because they care more about the reputation of Jesus than their own. Whose reputation do you care more about? Whose reputation do you live for? See, the picture that we have for us before is like Paul and Timothy, these Thessalonian believers, they, they want to live for the reputation of Jesus more than anything else. And so one of the things that Paul does as he's longing to be with the Thessalonians, but he can't, is he sends Timothy. Um, and that's the first thing he does, but he also writes this letter. That's the second thing that he does is he writes this letter, and let's continue on in this letter, since Paul can't be with the Thessalonians, what he wants to write to them. And this is where the word destiny or destined comes up, and it might shock you, buckle up, um, because it might be a rough landing for some of you to read these words um, that are from the Apostle Paul. But it goes, Timothy was not sent to, he was sent to establish and exhort you, like in verse 3, that no one be moved by these afflictions. For you yourselves know be what we are destined for this. For when we were with you, we kept telling you that beforehand. Did you ever have somebody say, didn't I tell you that? I kept telling you. They were, maybe they're repeating themselves to you and you're annoyed because they repeat themselves to you. They're just doing it because they want to make sure you catch something. Well, Paul kept telling them beforehand that they were to suffer affliction. And just as it has come to pass and just as you know. So what are they destined for? The words are right in front of you. That's why I told you to get your own Bible. Now, not believe me when I read it, but to, for you to see it for yourself. They were destined for afflictions. Paul said, we kept telling you this. This wasn't just like a passing comment in a sermon that we hid in there because we were scared. If we told you that, you would be afflicted for following Jesus. You might not follow him anymore. He was saying, no, we told you repeatedly. If you follow Jesus, you're going to suffer. If you follow Jesus, there are going to be afflictions. If you follow Jesus, it's going to be hard. If you follow Jesus and stay true to his words, you will be persecuted. It is your destiny. Now, imagine if we were to put up a poster um, of oh, the word destiny uh, and a picture of a guy in jail. That wouldn't be very inspiring, right? Most of us probably wouldn't hang that up on our wall. Or, or if we put a poster up of somebody laying in a hospital bed and with the word destiny. And this is kind of like what Paul's telling these guys. It's like, you're going to have afflictions. You're going to get sick. Some of you are going to get thrown in prison. Paul knows that because he writes many of his letters from prison. You know, maybe the next job offer that you get, it might be your dream job, but you might not read in the fine print or they might not tell you in advance, like, it's a horrible work culture. People hate each other here. You're destined for some 
tension at work. Uh, this afternoon, Franklin Graham is in town for the God Loves You tour. I don't know if you know Franklin Graham or what the God Loves You tour is all about, but they're going to have some music play, and Franklin Graham is going to stand up on a stage, and he's going to tell people about God's love for everybody through Jesus Christ. He's going to do that this afternoon. I doubt in his notes that he's going to also tell them that if you follow Jesus, you'll be persecuted, and that if you follow Jesus, you're probably going to suffer. It's probably not in his notes, not because he's not a great man who loves Jesus and he's not, he's not teaching a wrong gospel. It's just not often offered in a call to follow Jesus. Hey, God loves you. He accepts you. He wants to be in a relationship with you, and you're going to suffer. Now, anybody here want to raise their hand for that type of relationship? Not a lot of people will be raising their hand. And here's the reality. How long was Paul with this group of people? Three weeks. And in three weeks, the very beginning of following Jesus, he told them repeatedly, you're going to suffer. You're going to have afflictions. Now, all people face afflictions in life. This isn't just for people who follow Jesus. But there are things that are unique when we follow Jesus that we will suffer. Uh, if we follow Jesus the way that we're called to, Jesus doesn't always come into our life just to make it easier and happier. In fact, that rarely happens. He does promise fullness of life. But it doesn't mean ease of life. We will face afflictions. It is unique to those who follow Jesus for various reasons. And you need to know that when they come, God's not mad at you. You need to know that in that troubling circumstance or through that thing that you're going through that's harder than you've, it's the hardest circumstance you've ever faced in your life, that, that God is not a, an evil, mean God up there taking joy in that. He loves you and he cares about you. He's going to use that actually for your good. And the Thessalonian church knew in the first three weeks that their following of Jesus Christ would include some of this. You know, in the American church, there's not a lot of teaching about suffering that's biblical. Many are led to believe that if you suffer, you probably just lack faith to get out of those circumstances or to be healed from that sickness. If you just had more faith in God, you'd be better. And so it's your fault. Others are taught that God might be disciplining you. There's probably sin in your life somewhere. So repent. And then once you repent, you'll be healthy and happy. And that leads some to live in constant fear of what am I doing wrong? And they're on a sin hunt all of their life looking for some sin in their life that they can't figure out because they have some sickness or disease or because they're going through some suffering and they're wondering, where did I let God down? Now, that doesn't mean that none of us need to have more faith in God. Probably all of us need to have more faith in God, right? And it, and it doesn't mean there's probably something in our life that we can't see and we need maybe the help of others to see where we're off base. We're not perfect people. We, we need to repent of sin. So it doesn't mean I'm saying that those things aren't true, but they're not the causes for suffering. You know, and suffering is like Christianity 101 in Paul's class at the Thessalonians. And the first thing that we learn about suffering, I want you to learn a couple things about suffering this morning. And the first is that God uses suffering to teach his own son, Jesus Christ. So if you're like, hey, I don't believe what you're saying, think about this thought. Jesus suffered. He was betrayed by his closest friends. His family thought he was crazy at times. He was beaten and mocked and scorned. He was crucified on a cross. And in Hebrews... The author of Hebrews says, although he was a son, talking about Jesus, he learned obedience through what he suffered. Do you know how you might learn how to obey God sometimes? The same way Jesus learned, through suffering. Your afflictions, trials, the circumstances that are really hard for you can teach you. They taught Jesus Christ. And if you're thinking like, no, that teaching doesn't apply to me, well, it applied to the Savior of the world so why would it not apply to us? You know, we believe, why would we believe that anybody who tells us that suffering should be avoided at all costs, pray harder, repent more, if Jesus suffered and benefited from it, why wouldn't we? That's the first thing for us to learn about suffering. The second thing is Jesus taught that we will suffer. He told people that in the world you're going to have tribulation, you're going to have trouble. In Matthew 5, the famous Sermon on the Mount, blessed are you when people revile you, meaning they persecute you, they make fun of you, they mock you for my sake, meaning for following me. So we see very clearly, like, suffering was in Jesus' life. 
It was part of what he taught. And what we see here, as we're in this book, Thessalonians, we're seeing that suffering was a regular part of Paul's discipleship as well. Paul, as he led people in faith to Jesus, as he went town to town, this is what, if you don't know who the apostle Paul was, he just went town to town um, and started telling people about Jesus. People would believe in Jesus and there would be a church there. And then he would go on to the next town and he would tell more people about Jesus and there'd be a church there. And as he went to these towns, he would teach them. And what we're learning here is he, remember, I told you constantly that you were destined for suffering. He said that to the Thessalonians. But he also writes in his letter to the Roman church. He says, we're going to suffer with Jesus. He said it to the Philippians who were in Philippi. He said, you're going to suffer for his sake. As he writes to Timothy, who's a young pastor, um, those who live a godly life are going to be persecuted. So he told that to Timothy. Other followers of Jesus had this view as well. Look at James 1 on the screen. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. So just just in case you're wondering what kinds of suffering are okay and not okay, well, there's a variety of kinds of them that you're going to encounter. And you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect. What's the full effect that it's supposed to have? That you may be perfect and complete. Do you want your relationship with God to grow more, to be more complete? You know what? Your faith in Jesus will actually be incomplete if it, your life is just easy. If your life is just always comfortable, if everything always goes your way, everything you touch turns to gold, good for you. But you're actually missing out on something according to the first followers of Jesus. They're saying suffering actually is going to strengthen your faith. It'll deepen your trust in God. Now, I'm not saying like, hey, let's just be weird and try to look for suffering in our life. Like, you don't have to do that. It'll come. Don't look for it. Um, and I'm not also saying that we shouldn't ever pray for deliverance. I'm not saying we shouldn't pray for healing. We should pray for healing. We should pray that God would make this situation less challenging, that God would remove these circumstances. But if he doesn't, may I learn from them. If these circumstances persist, God has something for me. Because what I've heard from Pastor Tim today already is that Jesus suffered, Jesus taught that we'll suffer, his disciples said we'll suffer, and part of that teaching is that it'll make my faith in Jesus stronger. So Paul taught this to the Thessalonians because he knew it would come and he wanted to make sure they'd continue to follow Jesus. He didn't want to like rope them into a relationship with Jesus, tell them everything's going to be great and then everything isn't great and they're like, that guy fooled us. We're not following Jesus anymore. And then they stopped following Jesus. Paul wanted people to follow Jesus to the very end. And that's why if you look in the next verse, in verse 5, he says, For this reason, when I could bear it no longer. Remember, it's so dramatic. I can't visit you guys. Remember, that's the whole theme of this section here. I sent to learn about your faith. Because why? For fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you and our labor would be in vain. Paul thought that maybe, you know what? If you go through trials and you didn't listen to my teaching about suffering, you thought Jesus is just going to make your life happier and healthier and easier, and the trials came, that maybe you would give up on following Jesus. And Paul was worried. I only had three weeks with these guys to tell them about following Jesus. And maybe they're not going to follow Jesus anymore. Maybe, like Paul, you worry about that. For other people in your life, where you've seen them place their faith in Jesus, and you just hope they make it. You hope they, that when hard things happen, they're, they're able to make it through, knowing that God is still a good God who loves them and cares about them, that God is a sovereign God in control of all things. You know, so many people will follow Jesus, and when life gets hard, Jesus is the first person to go. I want to follow Jesus, but my girlfriend uh, doesn't want to follow Jesus, so I'm sticking with her. Or, or my boyfriend isn't interested in Jesus, so I'll stick with him and forget about this Jesus thing. Or maybe people come to Jesus and think that their life is going to get better, their business is going to improve. I've heard this from several people. Like, I thought that is, if I followed Jesus, things would just go better in the workplace and my business would get back on track, and it doesn't. And Jesus is the one that gets thrown off to the side because it's his fault that my business didn't flourish you know, and then as new followers of Jesus often start reading some of the teachings of the Bible, and it's like, wow, this is pretty clear. 
Don't have sex outside of marriage. Don't get drunk. Give money away instead of keep it all for yourself. It says to die to yourself. Now, these are pretty crazy teachings. I mean, I don't know if you know what the symbol for the Christian faith is. Does anybody know what the symbol for the Christian faith is? Is it a sofa? Is it a recliner? Uh, is it a hammock at the beach? It's a cross. Jesus said, follow me and take up your cross. It's a sign and a symbol of dying to yourself. It's a sign of suffering. That's the Christian faith. And yet we think it's more like a sofa. That, you know those sofas that have everything you need on it? It's almost like a control pat tower. You know, you have your cup holders and you have your remote controls and everything like that. That's not the symbol for the Christian faith. And Paul's worried that maybe as he heard this parable, I don't know if you know the parable of the four soils, when Jesus talks about there was a sower and he sows these seeds and he throws it in different places. And some of those places are like hard ground and nothing ever comes up. And maybe some come up right away, but it dies. And there's other fertile soil where that, that, that fruit comes. And he's talking, Jesus is telling, telling this parable of what it's going to look like for some people when they hear the gospel. Some people will be hard. They won't want to receive it. They're not interested in Jesus. Others will receive it with great joy and excitement, and then all of a sudden it's going to die down. And then others will be in fertile soil, and they'll last and they'll endure. But if we go back to that soil that Paul heard this parable from Jesus, that it comes to life right away, but then it dies away. Do you know why it dies away? It says Jesus talks about in his explanation of that parable when they experience tribulation, they will not follow Jesus anymore. It doesn't say if they experience tribulation, meaning Jesus knew that if you follow me, it's going to come. He doesn't use the word if in that parable. He uses the word when, when tribulation comes. They might have come to life right away in Jesus and been really excited to follow him, but as soon as the first hard thing came related to following me, the first person that defriended or unfriended them or unfollowed them or said, you know, I can't believe you would love a God who would do this to me. And it's like, yeah, you know what? I can't believe that either. I'm not going to love that God anymore. This is what Jesus was talking about. Those were the types of actual things that would happen if people don't understand the concept and teaching of suffering. And Paul didn't want this to be the story for the Thessalonians. That's why he's like so eager to get back there, make sure that they're doing okay. And the reality is what we're seeing from the Apostle Paul in this you know, this, this writing so far is like he really longs to be with people. He longs to help them and serve them. And what we learn is that good pastors are going to prepare their congregations for suffering. And as a pastor, when suffering comes your way, a lot of you will write it down on that connect card. And I'm really grateful that you do. And it's just like a little window into your life. Please pray for my family. Pray for this going on in my life. And we do. And I always pray that God would bring healing, that God would bring restoration, that God would bring reconciliation, that, that God would remove that affliction from you. I always pray that. And at the same time, I'm also praying, God, I realize that might not happen. And I'm also praying for you that you would endure through it, that God would use that to strengthen your faith in Jesus, that God would make sure that you're protected from bitterness towards him or envy from this other person doesn't have this struggle. Why do I? I pray that God would make you a stronger follower of Jesus in light of those afflictions. If we only have a comfortable journey, we miss out according to James, those words that we read. And so my question for you is, how do you see suffering? Do you see it as a tool to strengthen your faith? That makes you more like Jesus. And again, don't seek suffering out. Um, even when it comes, you don't need to like welcome it with open arms and be like, thank you so much, God, for sending this to my life. No, it's, it, we're not that weird, um, but close. Because we do want to view it with a biblical perspective saying, God, you have put this in my life for a reason. Help me to know what that reason is. And Paul and these early followers of Jesus, they saw suffering as a blessing. That's why James says, count it joy when it comes to your life. Because it strengthened his faith in Jesus. It produced a resolve in him to make him more like Christ. You're destined for suffering. The poster on the wall, if it's more true to reality, should be the hospital bed or the prison cell or some affliction that says destiny. Because for most of us, we'll live longer in afflictions than we will at the beach. Or then we will climbing a mountain. 
You're destined for suffering, but it's for your good. And Paul goes on. Let me just read through some of these other phrases that he, that he shares as he writes in the next verse, verse 6. Uh, but now that Timothy has come to us from you, remember, he couldn't get to the Thessalonians, so he sent Timothy. Timothy comes back, and he's hearing a report about them. He says, he brought good news of your faith. And reported that you're remembering us kindly and long to see us as we long to see you. Paul wasn't sure. There were some rumors going around that he wasn't a good guy. There were some people and some haters. Everybody's got a hater. And he had a bunch. And he wasn't sure if the Thessalonians were in that camp or what camp they were. But some of them remembered Paul kindly. And they actually wanted to see him again. And for this reason, verse 7, Brothers, in all of our distress and affliction, we have been comforted about you through your faith. So they're still following Jesus. In verse 8, he says, For now we live... If you are standing fast in the Lord, for what thanksgiving can we return to God for you? Paul's a real thankful guy. We read about that in the first opening of this uh, letter two weeks ago. Seeing it again here, he's thankful to God for them, for the joy that we feel for your sake before our God. Verse 10, as we pray most earnestly night and day, that we may see you face to face and supply what is lacking in your faith. For us to say that Paul is encouraged is an understatement. He's like through the roof, excited about the Thessalonian Christians who went through it. They went through afflictions. They're still going through it, and they're still following Jesus. What I like about this passage, what stands out to me is this verse 8. For now we live if you're standing fast in the Lord. It was like a breath of fresh air for Paul when he gets this report from Timothy. Hey, they're still following Jesus. He's like, Wow, now I live. I'm telling you, this guy's dramatic. You know, I don't say this often. Now I live because you're following Jesus. But this is how he felt about when he saw people persevere through trials and still followed Jesus. Some of you are teachers. Raise your hand if you're a teacher, if you've ever taught somebody something. And you're like, I hope they get this. All right. So teachers, you know when a kid is struggling with a certain subject that you're teaching them. Maybe it's just a basic math and writing or reading. Uh, or maybe something that's more complex. And you see your students, you're teaching them. It's frustrating because it's like, is this you know, a reflection of my teaching? Am I a bad teacher? If they're not getting it. Um, but as soon as that student gets it, that brings a little life to you, right? It's like, yes, all right, they get it. You know, for now I live as a teacher. Or maybe you're a boss and you have to train employees in certain tasks. And you're like, some employees, they're just not getting it. Maybe am I having a bad day and I can't train them well? And all of a sudden when those employees, they're able to do their job the way they're supposed to do it and when they're supposed to do it and those things, you're like, yes, as a boss, now I can live. I'm not going to come to work being anxious all the time because I know the people that I've trained can actually do do their job. Paul, as a minister of the gospel, when he sees people follow Jesus, he's like, yes, now I can live. They do have a personal relationship with Jesus that doesn't depend on me as a minister. They know God personally. They believe in his word and his truth, and they follow him. And it's great joy when that happens for any minister of the gospel. You know, I'll have to admit, as this is Compassion Sunday, I thought I would have to do a hard break from like, this teaching has absolutely nothing to do with Compassion International. Um, and I need to make a transition from this passage to Compassion. You're thinking, is this the hard break that you're talking about? No, it's not. Because I'm going to tell you about my, the child that as a church, we sponsor a child. His name is William Alejandro, and uh, he just goes by Alejandro. So you may not know this, but five years ago, when we did our first Compassion Sunday, um, and Compassion is about really asking people to sponsor a child that cares for their medical needs, uh, helps them get an education, uh, also you know, provides like spiritual teaching and discipleship for them. Uh, as a church, we sponsored this young man. Why don't you pull his picture up? Uh, his name's Alejandro. Say Alejandro out loud with me. One, two, three. Alejandro. Good. All right. So there's Alejandro. He's 12 years old now. Uh, we sponsored him five years ago as a church. Some of you may or may not know that. And the reason uh, I chose uh, Alejandro for the child that we would sponsor as a church is because he shares a birthday with the church. October 1st, when our church started, uh, is the same date that Alejandro was born, except this is a unique sponsorship. Most sponsors are older than the children that they sponsor, right? We're actually younger as a church. We're, we're only five years old. He's 12 years old now. He's got seven years on us, but still we sponsor Alejandro. And on behalf of United, I communicate um, with him. I'll write him letters, and I hear back from him in letters, and I get to hear about progress that he's making in school, things that are going on with his family, his 
His dad lost his job a couple of years ago, and we were able to send some money to help their family and care for them a little bit more in that time. And we, we know a little bit about Alejandro. And one of the things that happened was something that I could relate to from verse 8. When I got a letter from him, for now I live, you know that feeling, now I live because you're following Jesus? Alejandro, you might have heard this before, but if you haven't, got baptized last year. And, and for me, that lifted my spirits. Yes, you could applaud for that. I was excited for him. I was excited that he had heard the gospel, that he had made a personal decision to follow Jesus and to be baptized and unite his life with Christ. I was excited for him. I was also excited for our partnership with Compassion. Sometimes you give money away to organizations and nonprofit organizations. You're not really sure exactly what's happening with it. You're not sure if they're actually representing Jesus well to the people that they minister to. And so it built my faith for now I live because Compassion International, one of the things that they do is they partner with a local church in different communities where there's children that have these needs. And so the local churches... Uh, represent compassion. They share, you know, all these different resources, but most importantly, they're teaching these kids about Jesus. They're teaching them about the fundamentals and foundations of what it means to have a relationship with Jesus. So I was super encouraged by this organization called Compassion International. And Compassion's, you know, main mission is to to release children from poverty in the name of Jesus Christ. And so when we hear the word poverty, we do think of like financial poverty. The, the reality that there's 385 million children who live in extreme poverty, meaning that their families survive on less than $2.15 a day. Let me say that one more time. $2.15 a day, less than that, is extreme poverty. 385 million children in the world live like that. Can you imagine that? So releasing children from poverty in Jesus' name. But, but poverty is more than just financial poverty. There's a spiritual poverty that all of us have, that apart from Christ, we're empty. We are poor. Life is meaningless without Christ. And because of the work of compassion, Alejandro now has not just resources to be able to eat food and to see a dentist and a doctor and to go to school and have teaching about the math and science and writing and reading, but he's also hearing about Jesus who came and gave his life as a sacrifice for his sins. Maybe you're in poverty this morning and not a poverty where you don't have anything in your bank account, but a poverty where I don't have Jesus in my life. And without Jesus, I'm empty. Spiritually before God, if I don't have the fullness of Jesus, I have nothing to bring to him. And maybe this morning, maybe that's the best news that you need to hear is that Jesus gave his life for you so that you don't have to be in poverty spiritually, but you can be rich and full because of who Jesus is and the work that he did for you. And Alejandro received that. And it brought great joy. For now I live because I heard that Alejandro follows Jesus. I was excited about that. You can have that same excitement as well as a sponsor of a child who prays for a child regularly, who writes a letter back and forth to them a couple times a year, and you hear updates on them. You know, this is a, a way that followers of Jesus express and share the love of Christ, is to take the need and the resources that we have and to give them so that somebody else can benefit. And specifically, Compassion does this for children all around the world, 385 million children. There's a lot more child, children to sponsor. But Compassion has churches established in different parts of the world that are working to make sure that kids can receive spiritual as well as um, just care uh, physically uh, for their needs. And so when we sponsor a child, one of the things that it does is helps them to see the love of God for them. And this morning, uh, Compassion put out a video. They put out a video every year. We want to watch the video that they put out for this year's Compassion Sunday. It's a great story. It comes from Uganda. So if you want to just check out the screens, we'll watch it together. My grandfather used to say, God is with us, and God will always be with us. Every time that we had the Lost Resistance Army or the LRA, we are in a village, it was fear. The fear of being abducted and being trained to become child soldiers. All the huts 
were burned to the ground. I felt hopeless. No food, no water. It sent me into silence. My grandfather used to give us candy for memorizing Bible verses. It gave me hope. When the war intensified, my grandfather put me on a bus to live with my mother. My mother did not share much about her life because she had her own struggles. But I remember this Saturday, she woke me up and she said, I'm taking you to church. I saw children laughing. I had no idea what was going on, but I knew this was a good thing. Give me that smile. Malakwa. Beautiful. And my life was forever changed. That same month, I got a letter from my husband and wife and the letter said they loved me. And at that moment, I had hope that everything would be okay. Growing up, my compassion sponsors encouraged me and continually spoke truth into my life. The Compassion Project became a place of healing and restoration. It was a place of refuge for me. I got medical care. I got an education, and it became a great reminder of the Jesus that my grandfather introduced me to at the age of five. If you're thinking about sponsoring a child, I would say act, sponsor a child because for me, my life was forever changed. And you can do that too. Well, it is not an understatement to say that we can change somebody's life uh, this morning um, by sponsoring a child. Maybe you've sponsored a child before, you might sponsor a child with other organizations, which is great, and, uh, and we're grateful that we can do this. Rachel said, um, earlier that there's been 126 children sponsored uh, throughout the years here at United Church. And we're looking this morning to continue to increase that number, to invite people. Maybe this is the first time you're hearing about this type of opportunity. You didn't know that it existed. And you're like, hey, I just want to learn a little bit more. This morning, I don't know that I'm ready to become a child sponsor. And you can learn more about that. We have a table set up in the back uh, with some more information that's back there. You can also look at what's the child sponsorship packet. And it teaches you about a child. Um, we uh, focus on the country of Ecuador here at United Church, and so every year we have children that are from um, the country of Ecuador, and so you can look at their information, their packet, their age, a little bit about them, and learn about the world that they live in, and, and see the needs that they have, and you can consider and pray about, like, hey, should I sponsor a child? If you have never done this before, I would strongly encourage you, like, maybe you've never even given money to, like, a nonprofit or a church. This is a great first step of giving. This is, United makes no money off of this. This isn't about um, anything uh, for United. We don't benefit from this in any way, but it's a great first step for you to take the resources that God's given you. Um, and you could be a high school student who works a part-time job. You have resources. We have high school students who sponsor children through compassion. Maybe you're a college student. You're like, man, money's tight. We all know that in those college years, money's tight, but you have money. And we have college students where money is tight and they sponsor compassion children. Maybe you're an adult and you're like, money's still tight. Uh, those college years, it's still tight. But you still get it regularly, right? It still comes regularly in every other week in the form of a paycheck or a direct deposit. You see, we have a lot more than people who live off of less than $2.15 a day. And we can take what God has given us. And this is a great first step to help somebody else's life to benefit them, um, to not live for our own reputation, but to live for the reputation of others, to live for somebody else and to help them. So this is a great opportunity that I want to encourage you uh, to consider to sponsor a child today. Um, and so if you've never done this, you can learn more about it. You can act today. Um, and maybe you have sponsored a child before. You're like, check, I already do this. Compassion also says, you can sponsor another child. Did you get a raise in the last year? Maybe you can sponsor another child. Uh, I know that our family 
you know, cumulatively, we sponsor multiple children, uh, and we try to keep up with all of them. And uh, it's something that many families here at United, and maybe even individuals, uh, sponsor multiple children as well. And so I encourage you, can consider, can I sponsor another child this year? So I'm just going to pray for us. I'm just going to pray that God would speak to us about this, that God would move in our heart. And if we're supposed to sponsor a child, that we just go back to the table, we'd grab a packet, and we would, one of the easiest ways that they want you to do this is just through a QR code, and you can do it on your phone, or you can fill out the information on the packet. We have a team back at the table that can give you some more information about how to actually do the logistics of sponsoring a child. But I'm just going to pray that God would speak to us, that God would move on our hearts if we're supposed to sponsor a child this year to do that. Um, And so let's Let's pray together.